So welcome to the exam room live brought to you by the Physicians Committee and the Planted Expo. We are here to talk about longevity. Now, who here has a copy of Dr. Greger's book, How Not to Age? Two for two. All right. So let me ask you this. One of the things that, that really struck me was early in the book, matter of fact, listening to it, um, you said that you turned 50 or were turning 50 during the process of writing the book. How much of that was a factor in your decision to write How Not to Age, the big 5-0? Um, uh, I don't, yeah, I don't think it played any role, really. I mean, it was just, it was just, um, I, you know, looking out at the field as like, what is the most misunderstood, messy, misinformed, where's most sexy bullshit? Um, on the internet, right? And so I, so I just did the weight loss book, right? How Not to Diet, right? You want to know sexy bullshit, right? Dieting industry. But there's just so much crazy misinformation out there. And with so much, you know, uh, noise and nonsense, I just wanted there to finally be this kind of evidence-based tome. And so then it just let me, okay, what else is out there that's even worse? I don't know if it's worse, but it's just as bad as the, you know, the... Uh, longevity field where there's just this craziness out there and no one's basing anything in science. Um, and so I was like, all right, I mean, look, I, yeah, sure, I wanted to know the answers to this, but I knew, I mean, you know, that I'd have to do the deep dive and share it with everyone. I was like, so excited to do it, yeah. Right on, but all right, so sexy BS, man. When you talk about aging, you think about wrinkles, you think about gray hair, that kind of stuff, right? But you went beyond that in this book. I mean, you really went to a deep dive. Were you concerned at all that people wouldn't necessarily gravitate toward it because it wasn't BS? Like, you're giving people substance here as opposed to what they usually see on TV and on blogs. Well, I mean, I mean, it, well, it is a big book. It is that. Um, and it's a, I mean, so there's a concern. It's intimidating. And you always, you know, we want to have, like, uh, but, you know, the people that buy my books are people that don't want the fluff. They don't want the anecdotes. They don't want the before and after pictures, right? They want, like, what does the science show? What does the peer-reviewed medical literature, really the, the best available balance of evidence show right now? Um, and, you know, if, if they, you know, want to know, if they just want to hear good news about their bad habits, Probably not a good place to go. Yeah, man. You know, and I kind of wrestle with that, too. It's like, how do you like, create something that is going to appeal to people that are not necessarily in the health circles already? Because it's always been my philosophy that the people who aren't listening are the people that need to listen the most. And I think that when you're writing a book like How Not to Age, it kind of that same philosophy would fit. How do you reach the people that aren't really super ingrained in nutrition science but need this message more than the average person who's here with us? Well, I mean, that was really where the whole wrinkles, gray hair kind of stuff came in. So I'm hoping to br suck people in using the kind of vanity. Same thing with the weight loss book. Right. It's like, I don't care what people look like in bikini season, but <laughs> I want them not to get diabetes. I want them to not get osteoarthritis. But if bikini season is going to get them to start eating healthier and then they don't die of a heart attack, it's fine with me, right? If, you know, it's, you know when I talk to youth groups, they don't care about heart disease. I mean, they don't care, you know, but they care about acne, right? right. They care about athletic performance. They care, you know. Um, and so, you know, I, so I covered all, you know, what, what about your hair? What about your nails? What about, you know, you know in hopes that, you know, you suck them in for that, and then they start eating healthier, and oops, all of a sudden they didn't die of cancer. Bonus! <laughs> Many years down the line. Those youth groups are going to, like, call you up in 30 years and just say, hey, thanks, Doc. I you, hope so. You well, they me. don't have to, but uh, it'd be nice. What is it like for Dr. Gregor to speak to a group of kids? Like, is it a science class that you're speaking with? You know, I haven't done, I haven't done a lot of that in a while. Um, I, but I used to have a really fun talk. Um, that involved lots of fake doggy doo doo, um, and it was it was kind of like the environmental impact of diet, and so you know there's a manure problem, and so you had to have buckets of this stuff really to to, to for the visual. 
But it was, I mean, it was hard to get through TSA. I tell you, you go through security with that, they start asking questions. Yeah, no. <laughs> I can actually see you being a really fun teacher, man. Like, did you ever have aspirations of, oh, of going oh, that route? Right? Well, that's what I'm doing. That's what I see my role is. Sure. Someone asked me what I'm, I'm real. I'm a teacher. That's what, that's what actually doctor, the root of the word doctor means to teach. Um, and that's what I think the role of medical professionals should be. Look, it's your body, your choice. You want to go, you know, bungee jumping or smoke cigarettes or, you know, not wear your seatbelt. You do you. But you should know about the predictable consequences of your actions and then make up your own mind. And as a physician, that's what we do. People in your situation who continue to do X, Y, and Z are likely to suffer this, this, and this. Or there's this other option, but oh my God, you might have to eat broccoli and, you know, we'll go down that route and then go for it. You know, it's, but as long as people, you know, are fully informed, they should do, be able to do whatever they want. But I love teaching. In fact, eventually, I imagine I'll end up uh, teaching full time. I mean, just look, if I, if there will come a time where I am sick enough of standing in customs lines for three and a half hours. Hello. Um, where instead of me coming to them, let them come to me. And I'll just have like a big, you know, whatever. And, uh, and teach and, you know, wear sweater vests and, you know, whatever it takes to, uh, to continue getting the message out there, but just not have to travel so much. I guess the computers at Pearson were still down when you got in yesterday. I had to fill out the form by hand. Oh, because that, was that the storm? It, I have no idea why the network would have been down. Oh, that's right. just a little aside. I, I didn't look. do it. Jesus, I tell you, <laughs> hours. Do I look that suspicious? What was your favorite subject in school? Were you always a science guy? Always a science guy. Always. In fact, yeah, when I went to Cornell, so I was a, a biophysics major, and they had to like. Yeah, they, uh, you got to take some social sciences and humanities. I was like, really? And I tried to do it. And, and so I eventually, oh, so I eventually changed my major to be, a, to be general biology, specializing in general biology. What? And, yeah. And that allowed me the most flexibility to basically take all science. So I know nothing about, like, Shakespeare or, you know, all the important things in life. But I can tell you juicy things about, I don't know, random plants. I mean, I, I, I'm not a Cornell graduate, but general science specializing in general science. That's right. Well, it just gave me the flexibility because you pick something they want you to do specific, you know, don't, don't tie me down. I got a wide ranging interest. That's like uh, uh, somebody majoring in history with a you know minor in history. Like that's just awesome. That's like that extra history. Nice. That's a, extra science right extra there. Extra science with science on top with science sauce. Yeah. Who would who would take Dr. Greger's class? Like if he became Professor oh, Greger. Ah, that's sweet. Come on. Would, would I mean? Would you grade on a curve? Would everybody get an A? Or oh, would you be like I a hate tough curves. I, no, you know what? You know I, I, there's um. The kind of the latest trend is you, you're graded on a curve, but then you get your real grade, which doesn't really count. But the still, you, you, just so like, just so you know, you really suck. But you know that you get this grade because everybody else sucks too. Yeah, you, uh, you strike me as not being the participation trophy type of guy. Ah, uh, I mean, look, no. In fact, so I. You know, one of my uh, best experiences at Cornell was I was a teaching assistant for kind of like biology for majors. And it was a wonderful, wonderful course where you had to prove mastery of the material. Not like get 85% right. No, 100% mastery. And the only way to do that is you had, it was all oral exams. You had to come to me and you had to prove that you completely mastered you know, that chapter before you can even move on to the next chapter. And you could fail over and over. You could fail as many times as you want, but you just come back and keep doing it. And so anyone who got through that class knew the material. That's how it should be. Like, who wants a doctor that got 15% wrong? Like, 85, that's a pretty good score. But do you want to be the doctor's like, ah, oh, that, that was the 15% I didn't get right? No, you want to master the material. So how cool is that? Oh, my God. I was, I mean, 
I, yeah, I was brutal. Brutal. How many friends did you have? Oh, my God. Not many in that <laughs> class. But, no, and, you know, one of my favorite questions was in, like, Webster's Dictionary. It has a picture of the cell, right? The cell. And there's some glaring error in the picture of the cell in Webster's Dictionary, maybe still to this day. And I would whip out the dictionary, open up the cell, and say, what's wrong? What's wrong with that picture? And they'd have to get it, and then they'd feel all cool, and they better feel cool, or they'd go back, study, do more. Ah, so cool. Can you believe? Like they had the endoplasmic reticulum going straight to the exterior of the cell. What were they thinking? Who wouldn't catch that, right? Did you contact them? Did you set them straight? I should have, but then I didn't, you know, oh, so cool. I'm going to go back and look at Webster's. Do it. Yeah. <sighs> He's a smart guy. Uh, who's got a copy of How Not to Age in their, in their hands? Can, can somebody hold that up for me real quick? And let me just see the thickness. Could you turn it to the side? All right, so you got how many citations into the book? 6,000 made the page? Oh, yeah, 6,000, I think. 6,000. Like made it. And the original manuscript had 13,000? Yeah, yeah. And so all the information is there. It was just in links and videos, yeah. Right, yeah. right. But talk to us about the tedious process it must have been to really... I mean, you're, you're taking out more than half at that point. Yeah, that was tough. I mean, yeah, yeah. Because, I mean, I really, there wasn't, I didn't want to take out any content. I mean, part of it was because, like, I worked really hard to dig it up. Sure. Right? But also, it's like, well, I wouldn't write it down unless I thought people ought to know it. Um, and so, first thing I did is take out all the summaries. Right? So, every chapter had a summary. And it's like the summary didn't offer any new information. It just kind of summarized the chapter. And the chapters are sometimes really dense. I thought it would be really helpful to have a summary. They all got killed. But in my book club, anybody do my How Not to Age book club? Yeah, so I went through and I actually went through. Here's the summary that used to be in it before I got the publisher maybe take it out. I wanted them to do it as a two, like they said it was too big, which is understandable. It was like over 1,200 pages. But um, I was like, well, let's do a two-volume set or something. And we're not interested. So anyway, so we took out the summaries. I was, oh, and then of course we put all the citations online. That cut down a few hundred pages. Um, and then we were like, well, we're just gonna have to have to do video. So, you know, a lot of the book, I, I really resist just making kind of blanket statements or just I don't want anything to be my opinion, right? I mean, I don't want to be like. Just trust me, take this supplement. Or just trust me, don't take this supplement, right? Right. It's like, well, I wasn't born with that information. You have a right to know how I arrived at that conclusion. And so I'm like, okay, let's look at this supplement. Here's all the studies that show this. Here's all the studies that show this. And, you know, I take people through, and this is the final, and this is the latest. And so, you know, uh, you know, and I don't even say take it or don't take it. I say here's the pros, here's the cons. Next. Um, but I realized that, you know, that 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 whole that, that kind of showing my work that could be offloaded to a video, um, you know, and so I could end up saying, okay, so you should, you know, I I encourage you to you know take this supplement X or whatever, and for the reasons why, you know, check out check out these these this video series. And so as long as, so the, the bottom line recommendations are all still in the book. I didn't take any of that out. Right. But it's really just kind of a lot of the kind of how I got there, um, it, you know, kind of offloaded. And that's really important for somebody. You know, someone like really wants to know, well, wait a second. I thought I heard that was a good supplement or I heard that was a terrible supplement. It really wants to see what the science is. All the science is there. In fact, it's nice. You watch the video. I can show all the papers and the graphs and stuff. Um, but, uh, yeah, but I wasn't able to keep all that in the book. How many people did you have helping acquire or accumulate all this research? Because if I close my eyes, I can almost picture a writer's room where everybody's in there just pouring over volumes of medical journals, coming up with this and just tossing out ideas. This would be good for the book. This would be good for the book. Or were you kind of a one-man band with this? Well, we have 19, 19 people on staff at nutritionfacts.org. Um, and uh, uh, so we started 2011. Um, and, uh, and so, in fact, we just brought on these two uh, PhD nutrition researchers, 
and I almost got to meet one last night. We're all remote. We're in continents all over the world. Almost. And so, but, and I was like, oh, I finally get to meet Susan. The book signing line was like so long, she couldn't even make it up the stairs to see me, so I actually did not meet one of our, one of our longtime employees. But, uh, but uh, one of these days, I'll get back to Phoenixville, Pennsylvania, and I will meet, I will meet, I mean, we've Zoomed and stuff, but it's not the same. Phoenixville, Pennsylvania? Phoenixville, Pennsylvania, the mayor was all excited to tell me about all the vegan options in Phoenixville. Very cool. He was front row. Is that as big as it sounds? It's so cool. It's a, no, I talked last night in the theater where The Blob was filmed. No way. The Blob the, Theater. That was me. The original, like the old, the, the blob, original. Yeah, the original. Not, not the 80s remake I was blob. in the theater. Harry Houdini performed in the theater I was in. It, boy, it was yeah, built in 1903. Very cool. You know you've made it when you've been in a theater where the blob, the blob was filmed theater. and Houdini performed oh, there. Oh, I made some terrible joke how uh, I'm no Harry Houdini, but uh, you, I, hopefully you can escape infirmity. By and Then I went into my talk. It was bad. And I couldn't even think of a good blob bun. I want to ask you, though, about 50 a little bit more. Uh, mm -hmm. Because, one, I, you know, I'm surprised that you are 50. Like, I, I honestly thought that you were still in your, your 40s, to be honest with you. Um, how does your view of 50 differ today than when you were little itty bitty Greg or even before giving people hell at Cornell? Oh, I remember thinking when I remember when my parents were 42 and I thought, oh, my God, that's so old. I'm like I and then, you know, you then you're 42 and you're like, I don't feel that old. But, you know, <laughs> yeah. Anybody else used to think 50 was really, really, really old? Really old. And now I how mean, many like, people think that you still have your whole life ahead of you, right? That's right. Well, I'm, I'm not quite 50 yet, but I hit 40. You know, that's good. Very nice. um, I want to ask you also, when you were on the exam room uh, at the uh, ICNM last August. I Wonderful asked you, conference. Everybody, everybody go. Uh, fantastic. One of my favorite nutrition conferences down in D.C. Put on PCRM. Did not even have to ask you to do that. Thank you. No, that was, uh, hey, it's a great conference. Man, thank you. You know, and unlike so many nutrition conferences, they, where they like recycle the same speakers over and over again, there's always this cool new content. In fact, last year, they wouldn't even let me come because I didn't have a new talk, right? Yeah, no, seriously. I'm like, I'd love to come speak. And I was like in the area and they're like, you gave that talk the other year. Well, yeah, not everybody was there. What? No. Yeah. No, well, no. But I thought that, you did speak last well, year. Well, no. They, well, uh, two years ago. So now I, yeah, I have a new talk go. now with How Not to Age. I was like, but, but now I got to wait like three years till I have a new book. I was right? like, They're picky. I'm telling you. I was going to like go buy you dinner. I was like, you came just to do the show? Like, yeah, my no. God, Gregor. Yeah, yeah. That's awesome. Uh, but yeah, it is tough. I couldn't even get booked on it this year. I think the only person that speaks literally every year is Dr. Barnard. As he should. Yeah. He's got new stuff. He's got a new book coming out. Power Diet. Power Foods? Power what Foods is it? Diet. The Power, Power Foods, Foods Diet. Diet. I almost yeah. got it. Yeah. So um, you dedicated How Not to Age to your great aunt Pearl, correct? Mm, it's true. I loved getting the opportunity to have you talk a little bit about her on the show. Um, how much of her and, and, and like just the memories of her longevity you know, kind of flooded through your mind as you were putting this book together? I was just, I mean, cool for me growing up, for someone I could, like, you know, ask, like, so, how was the 1918 pandemic? You know, I was like, you know, this is good stuff. And she had personal memories, making it to 103. All right, so let me ask you this. Uh, one of the things you talked about in the book, too, was a, a, a survey of people. And you asked, well, how long do you want to live? And, and there were three options on the table, but, uh, you know, 85 was what most people, I believe, wound up saying. But then the qualifier was, well, what if you could keep your mental faculties and your good health? How long would you want to live then? Infinitely. There's a huge difference between 85 as we know it and perhaps what you're beginning to unlock with uh, the science and the research here in the book in terms of what human longevity could be. But before we talk about what it could be, how would you answer that question? Is it 85 or is it infinite? Oh, 
Well, I mean, as long as I want to live. God damn it. Of course. <laughs> who, who wants to? No, so, but the re, the, the, what was interesting about the survey, right? So people, I think, were given 80, 120, or indefinitely. Um, and yeah, to everyone's surprise, people, most people put down 80. It's like, what? Why wouldn't you want to live longer? It's because uh, this, you know, this concept of health span. I mean, what's the point of living longer if you're in, you know, in horrible health? And in fact, in the U.S., you know, we were up until 2014 living longer lives, but more in sickness than in health. Um, so we're living like, you know, two years longer, but three more years of chronic disability where, you know, he couldn't even stand unassisted or, you know, I mean, serious uh, debilitating uh, chronic disease. And so it's like, well, you know, they see, you know, their, their family members with dementia, where they're like, I don't want to live like that. And so that's why this concept of health span, which is the number of years lived in good health, not just lifespan, is so important. But they're like, oh, in guaranteed physical and mental health, well, of course I want to live as long as I want to live. Mm. Um, and uh, yeah, so it was just to, to illustrate the health span concept. And what do we know about the average health span compared to lifespan right now? How many good years can we expect? Well, even lifespan is shortening. So we peaked in 2014 in the United States, in the States at least, um, and have been dropping every year since. This was before COVID, and he capped a couple more years after our lifespan. Um, and it's primarily because of the obesity epidemic leading to a diabetes epidemic. And so in the States, we're raising the first generation of Americans to live shorter lives on average than their parents. Um, and so, and so, right, I mean, so the, the chronic diseases are so severe they're actually, you know, people are, aren't even living that long. So, yeah, well, I think we're 43rd. Wow. The U.S. is 43rd in life expectancy. So people in, like, Slovenia live longer than Americans. Wow. How much does, I guess, overall happiness play in terms of our health span and our lifespan? Um, because you're talking about our, our rankings there. I also just saw another uh, survey that showed that in terms of Americans and happiness, even though we're in Canada, we're tumbling down that list as well. And I would imagine the more miserable be we become, the more we open ourselves up to being sick as well. Well, the good news is that happiness, stress, um, and bereavement, grief, um, all only impair our lifespan through poor lifestyle choices. And so, uh, as, and so the reason people who are stressed, suffer chronic stress, live shorter lives is because they are more likely to drink, to smoke, to do illicit drugs, and not take care of themselves. If, however, you're able to maintain your healthy lifestyle, then, you know, you don't die of bereavement stress. You can be stressed, you can be depressed, you can be anxious, you can be all that. As long as you maintain your health, um, then, you know, you don't uh, actually impair your lifespan. And, you know, the classic example of this is these European countries under Nazi occupation in World War II where, you know, you'd expect, I mean, it's, it's hard to imagine a more stressful situation, mm. right? Um, yet, what happened to heart disease rates? Plummeted. Diabetes rates plummeted. It was just miraculous, miraculous public health improvement. Why? Because the Nazis took all the livestock and left people eating garden vegetables and the barley that they used to feed the livestock. Um, and so there was no butter anymore. And so all of a sudden people were forced to eat healthier and had dramatic improvements in health despite the intense stress of, uh, of occupation. And so that gives you a sense how diet can trump these other kind of psychosocial factors. Diet, undoubtedly important, but you also reference though how big of an influence your, your partner in life or your spouse, your boyfriend, your girlfriend, whomever, how big of an influence they can have in your overall health. You mentioned that. Only because that affects your lifespan through lifestyle interventions because your partner smokes Right. And you're exposed to smoke or you're more likely to smoke. Your partner eats terrible and then you don't want to make two meals. So you start slipping and they're bringing home the donuts. And 
Right. But only, so if you control those for those factors, then you can eliminate that effect. But the problem is those social pressures um, uh, translate into impairments in lifestyle behaviors. So how often do you get people coming up to you and they say, well, I'm starting to eat healthy, I'm starting to take better care of myself, but my spouse is just giving me a harder than hell time about this and, and then there's such ridicule. What advice do you give to somebody in that situation who may be married to a, a really cynical couch potato chain smoker type? Well, I'm single, uh, <laughs> so... Uh, Hey, you know, you should try, uh, you know, uh, leveling up. That's uh, at nutrition underscore facts. The DMs are open. No, so, uh, well, no, you know, I mean, so does this person, if this person loved you, right, they think that you'd want to be around for a while, yeah. right? And so, I mean, I think I would take that as a serious problem with a relationship and would encourage them to find a social circle that supported them in their health and longevity. I would think so, too. You would be shocked at how many people, like, ask me about that. So I just assumed, honestly, that that happens to you as well. Staggering stat in the book. As we bounce around here, we're going to dive into some nutrition stuff because I think that that's what a lot of people here want to hear tonight, right? A lot of nutrition nerds in the house. Woo! Right? There we go. Give it up. It's okay. Embrace your inner nerd. Uh, if all cancers, I believe, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, if all cancers were eradicated in the United States, the average lifespan would only go up by three years? Three years. Why? Because if you don't die of one age-related disease, another age-related disease will kill you. The only reason that, you know, you didn't die of a heart attack, uh, you didn't die from a heart attack is because you died from cancer a week before. And so if you get rid of cancer, you're still dying a week later from a heart attack. That's why it's so important to slow the process of aging decrease the risk of all age-related diseases, so you're not just playing whack-a-mole. Wow. Is cancer one of... Heart disease is the number one preventable chronic disease that we it face. It is the for. number one cause of death of men and women in all of North America. Also among the top chronic diseases, even though it sits at the top, would you say it is the most preventable? Uh, oh, well, I mean, there's so many things that are preventable. Sure. Is it the most preventable? No. Lots of other things are more preventable. Talk to me. What would you put above it? Sh obesity. That's a good one. Obesity is like 100% preventable. You lock someone in a closet, 100% of the time, obesity goes away. <laughs> I mean, it's true. I mean, so it's like you are absolute 100%. Whereas some people are born with like congenital heart defects, and, you know, they can have bad heart things, and it's like there's nothing they can do. I don't think a lot of people, by and large, the average person, looks at obesity as a disease. It's so normalized. 2003, the American Medical Association, at least, for what it's worth, classified obesity as a disease. What's it going to take to get people to realize that, yeah, this is a disease just like any other, like heart disease, like well, cancer? I mean, that's what Big Pharma wants you to believe, at least, right? With yeah. these new... Uh, classes of GLP-1 um, agonists, these, uh, you know, Ozempic-type drugs. It's just a disease, so of course, the National Health Service should pay for it, Medicare should pay for it, and we should, you know, yeah. send more trillions their way. Look, man, I, and when it comes to weight loss drugs and weight loss surgery, obviously I had weight loss surgery, and I can, I can talk to you from the perspective of somebody who has been through it, and I see it now on the other side. I think that had I been armed with this information, I probably would have made a different decision at the time. Um, and, and so when I see the commercials for these types of weight loss drugs, I get irked because they're happy, they're pleasant, they're these big dancing presentation. And it's, it's not a knock on anybody who feels like they are at their wits end and they, they need something. But the showmanship and the glitz and the glamour is like really doing a disservice to that. Have you seen these commercials? Like these are big time like Broadway productions, I, that's man. That's why I don't have a TV. Bro, you're a happier man for it. They drive me up, up the wall. And I think that it only goes to perpetuate the idea that the answer is in a pill bottle. Ah, uh, not a pill bottle anymore. Now it's in a syringe. Catch up. Oh, Come on. Right. Sorry. Come on. Sorry. That's right. They're not going to talk about that. You're like, yeah, give yourself a shot. You'll feel better. Like, no, everybody wants a, wants a pill. But I think that it's, it's just frightening to me that it's 
televised to that extent in the states. I don't think it's legal in Canada to show medication commercials, is it? Like, so you guys probably don't have any idea. Yeah, it's what legal I'm in about. two countries in the world: New Zealand and the United States. Direct wow. to consumer drug ads, where they name the drug. Yeah. That's it. One of two. Two countries in the world. Well, aren't we lucky? How do you balance somebody who feels like they are at their wits' end, and they feel like they've tried everything, with you know balancing that and the desperation that comes with that, and then knowing that if you went the healthier route, the route that's going to have long-term success, it's going to require a lot more work, and it's going to require them to change their diet, which can terrify people. That was the hardest part, at least for me, was like trying to distance myself from all of the fast food that I was eating. People have a relationship with their food. I was speaking with somebody here earlier tonight who's just petrified of like taking this one thing out of their diet. And so how do you like really get through to somebody to say, hey, you can live without that one thing and you can have a healthier uh, life and a longer health span and lifespan if you're able to break free of that void? It's a difficult thing that people wrestle with. It sounds like you did it. You do. You got to I mean, go through hell. Yeah. But I mean, I mean, uh, I mean, you know, and look, you don't have to, you know, people have a difficult time saying, oh, I can, I, you know, there's no way I'm going to go my entire life without eating a pepperoni pizza or something I'm like then Don't. Oh, my God. So how much do you eat it now? How about cutting it in half? Could you not cut it in half? You know, people have this really black and white thinking. It's like, well, save for, for special occasions or something. Or, yeah. you know, just try to decrease, try to, you know, eat more fruits and vegetables. You know, there's all sorts of things you can do without, you know, people have this sense, well, if I can't do it all, I'm just, ah, oh, forget it. And just, you know, throw their hands up in the air. Or if you could do, you know, on one day, you don't eat as good as you'd like to, then the next day, eat a little healthier. Like, it really doesn't have to be, you know, it's not rocket science. And anything we can do in moving along the spectrum towards healthier eating, the better. All right, well, let me ask you this. Speaking of pizza, any, any pizza fans in the house? No judgment, judgment-free zone. I appreciate your honesty. Thank you. What's going to age you quicker, the pepperoni on the pizza or the cheese? Oh, definitely pepperoni. Really? Oh, yeah. Talk pepperoni. to us about the pepperoni. Yeah, so pepperoni is processed meat, bacon, ham, hot dogs, lunch meat, sausage, it is a known human carcinogen. Uh, 50 grams a day increases your risk of colorectal cancer, the number one cancer killer of non-smokers by 18%. Um, and, uh, and so, for example, in the Harvard cohorts, um, uh, switching from processed meat to plant-based protein netted the largest life expectancy gains compared to any other kind of protein swap. Whereas the NHAARP study, which is the largest study in human history on diet and health, it was uh, eggs were the worst, where swapping egg protein for plant protein gave you the most um, benefit. But, uh, but yeah, so it, it's a little battle to the finish for between processed meat and eggs, but they're both bad. Really? You, well, a lot of people say, well, well, just eat egg whites. Do they still have that same inflammatory response? Well, so this was a, uh, this is a study that looked at egg protein, and most egg protein is actually in the whites. Right. Um, but we presume that the problem, that the reason why you get between a 21 and 24% drop in the risk of premature death switching from egg protein to plant protein, even 3%, 3%, you get over 21% decreased risk of death. Um, uh, is uh, we presume it's because of the of the you know cholesterol found in the yolk, dietary cholesterol. All right. Well, let's talk though still about that cheese. What is the body's inflammatory response typically to cheese? Especially like you know you order a pizza these days. Would you like to pay an extra dollar and have even more cheese on there? And oh, by the way, for a dollar on top of that, we'll stuff the crust with cheese. So if somebody's just like a hardcore cheese junkie. What kind no. of inflammation are they looking at? Well, the most pro-inflammatory food component, so there's something called Dietary Inflammatory Index. I talk about this a lot in the inflammation chapter of the book, where you just put foods to the test. You give people food X, and then you just measure within the next few hours the levels of systemic inflammatory markers in the blood, like C-reactive protein or interleukin-6. And, and then you say, oh, is this a pro-inflammatory food? Does the inflammation go up in your body within hours of consumption? Or does your levels of inflammation go down after you eat the food? And so then you can, you know, you do that for hundreds of different foods, and you come up with dietary inflammatory index. Some foods are pro-inflammatory, some foods anti-inflammatory. And so then you can, like, score your diet. And if you have a positive score, it's, it's 
causes inflammation. You have a negative score, you, it actively decreases inflammation in the body. And the most inflammatory food component, not food, but food component, saturated fat. Saturated fat. And the number one source of saturated fat is dairy, thanks to not only cheese, but ice cream. Um, and, uh, yeah, I mean, so uh, we need to decrease our intake of saturated fat, trans fat, dietary cholesterol, um, all notably found in animal products, whereas the most anti-inflammatory food component is fiber, found only one place, and that's in plant foods, only one place concentrated, whole plant foods. Um, and there's other anti-inflammatory components, anthocyanins and, uh, you know, these aspirin-like compounds and flavonoids and... All sorts of wonderful stuff. Well, let me ask you about like saturated fat that is found in like a coconut. Coconut's going to have fiber with it too. Does that just kind of wash? Does one wash out the other there? Oh, it does when you eat whole coconuts. If you eat like unsweetened, you know, just like coconut flakes, actually has a neutral effect on your cholesterol because the coconut oil, the coconut fat within that coconut is increasing your cholesterol. Well, at the same time, the plant protein and the fiber found, because the whole plant food, is decreasing your cholesterol. Overall, you just have a neutral effect. Now, one could argue, well, yeah, but if you ate any other plant food, you'd actually have a negative. You'd actually drop your cholesterol. So by eating coconut, you're kind of, you know, blunting the natural benefit you'd have. And I, I mean, that's understandable, but, uh, you know, but it, it would have would be expected to have a neutral effect, as opposed to something like coconut oil, which just has the fat, which increases your LDL, which is a key risk factor for the uh, leading killer of Canadians. <laughs> All right, I want to go back uh, to, to meat, and then we're going to get to anti-inflammatory foods real quick, because I can just picture somebody watching this right now or listening to us, and they're saying, well, okay, he talked about pepperoni, but, you know, what's the lesser evil? Is just a regular steak a little bit less inflammatory? Is that going to age me a little bit less than eating the processed pepperoni? Oh, is yeah. chicken a healthier option, as so many people think? Can we rank those, or is that even worth ranking? I know you can rank them. I mean, so food is, foods aren't so much good or bad as they are better or worse, right? Food is a is a, is a zero-sum game. Every time you put something in your mouth, there's an opportunity cost, a lost opportunity to put something even healthier in your mouth. So it's like, are, you know, bananas good for you? Well, not compared to blueberries, right? But compared to a lot of other things you can put, well, yeah, okay. And so it's like, well, if you have a choice of what to put on your oatmeal, then one's better than the other, right? So it's like, is, uh, you know, is, 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 are eggs good? Well, compared to a breakfast sausage, according to the Harvard analysis, yes, better than processed meat, but not even close compared to oatmeal. Is fish good for you? Well, tuna sandwich, better than a bologna sandwich. True. No, no comparison to a hummus wrap or something, but... You know, it's you know we can each ramp up and improve our you know our choices day by day, and so yeah, absolutely you can rank, and so kind of the, probably the least harmful meat would be something like wild game, like moose, elk. We're talking four percent calories from fat, extremely lean, um, and so there were studies done in Australia on kangaroo meat, which is kind of like their venison, found that compared to supermarket beef, there was significantly less inflammation caused by the kangaroo meat compared to the supermarket beef, right? Now, so step in the right direction, absolutely. But why cause any inflammation at all? It was still pro-inflammatory food, but less pro-inflammatory than the, than, the, than the retail beef, okay. But if you instead you had eaten some beans, you'd actually have an anti-inflammatory effect. But you know, it depends what choices you have. You're on a desert island, and someone gives you, you know, uh, McDonald's or 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 kangaroo. Eat the coconuts. Eat the coconuts. <laughs> but I could just also, man, I could just close my eyes and picture somebody saying, "But Dr. Greger, my cows were grass-fed. They were pasture-raised. They were never in a pen. These were happy cows. How can they possibly be unhealthy? I'm eating happiness." A happy grass-fed cow will still cause inflammation. You look at me like I'm crazy, but I'm telling you they're out there. What, happy cows? Well, happy cows are definitely out there. I've got the app on my phone. But ha! I'm, I'm, t <laughs> I'm, I'm talking about, like, 
people who honestly think that they yeah, no, can't I mean, possibly I, I, this, I mean, this sense that, like, uh, you know, the level of stress hormones at slaughter makes for more harmful meat or something, I don't think there's any evidence. Whether your animal was happy or sad, they have the same amount of cholesterol, the same amount of saturated fat. I mean, the same, I mean, I, yeah, I don't think that's that's really. Any, I mean, maybe there's some kind of karmic something, but certainly right. nothing from a measurable, objective standpoint that I've seen in the literature. So can we put to bed this whole idea that cage-free, pasture-raised, grass-fed, all of that is kind of marketing mumbo-jumbo? No. Well, no. Not for, so for example, salmonella risk, you're much less likely to get salmonella, which is the number one cause of foodborne illness-related death in North America, number one risk of hospitalization, horrible disease, um, significantly less in cage-free eggs than in, in eggs from hens in cages. I mean, there's just, because of the way they're raised, there's more or less food safety risk associated with it. And so, yeah, that's a significant difference. All right, guys, be thinking about your questions. We're going to take some in just a little bit. Um, but I, I want to ask you a question from my colleague, Holly, uh, who's the only one here to have watched the Oprah episode so far. Um, she was fascinated in the book where you were talking about uh, autophagy. So autophagy for those of is us, cool. Yeah. For those of us who aren't familiar yet with it, could you explain what autophagy is? Absolutely. In fact, I will lead with that tomorrow at 1030 in the morning, presumably here on this stage. Um, so autophagy is one of 11 anti-aging pathways I cover in the book. And I think the only reason I cover it, it's, it probably came first in the alphabet. So that's the one I cover tomorrow. But uh, so it's a housekeeping process by which accumulated cellular debris is, uh, is cleared away, which may, um, uh, and this debris may play a role in the uh, aging process. Every, uh, every day our cells are producing, assembling like you know, 10,000 distinct proteins at any time, and each one can be misfolded or damaged. Um, and so we have this cleaning mechanism um, which is activated through prolonged water-only fasting. Unfortunately, to really ramp up autophagy, you have to fast so long it's not safe to do unsupervised, unmedically supervised. But thankfully, there's another way to activate autophagy. You can fast or go fast. Exercise induces autophagy. Um, you have to do it enough, though. 60 minutes of moderate intensity activity, like brisk walking, will boost autophagy. However, 20 minutes fails to move the needle. Um, in terms of diet, there are some things that suppress autophagy. Some things improve autophagy. One thing that suppresses it is acrylamide, which is a toxin that builds up, uh, formed in the frying process, found concentrated in french fries and potato chips. So we should try to avoid those foods. Um, in terms of things that boost autophagy, there's uh, something called chlorogenic acid, the primary antioxidant in coffee. So coffee boosts autophagy, which may explain why coffee drinkers live longer lives than non-coffee drinkers. I talk about uh, that. And finally, the food component that boosts autophagy, boosts our ability to kind of clean out our system, is something called spermidine, which is a longevity vitamin found concentrated in beans. Spermidine, that's a new one. I haven't heard that one before, spermidine. Yeah, you guys see my talk tomorrow. It's all spermidine all the time. Hey, with a little autophagy sprinkled in at the top. Um, epigenetics, you were involved in the Netflix documentary about the oh twins. Oh my that God, how cool was that? Man. Everybody see that? The new Netflix documentary called What you, you Are What You Eat just came out in January. So well done. Such a great documentary to share with folks. I was really impressed. It was the same people that did the Game Changers, which I think previously was like my favorite documentary in the space. Um, but I think in, for a general population, this new one is, is really the one to point to. What most surprised you? I mean, you're such a well-researched guy. I would be surprised, honestly, if there was anything that came out of that that made you say, like, wow, I wasn't oh, expecting Oh, no, the sexual arousal in women. No, no, so, the, uh, and so Game Changers, wonderful documentary where they had this great, probably the, f the, the funniest scene, the whole thing where they do this, um, this kind of, the, the, uh, using something called a ridges scan, which is measures erectile firmness 
after eating plant-based versus uh, meaty burrito. Um, and I, I'll, 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 I'll save the spoiler alert for But anyway. It's really good, y'all. That was, and who came up with this idea to wrap things around their penises? That was you? That was me. No way. When you think penises, think Dr. Gregor. Yeah, no, that was, no. Well, so, I mean, that's actually something that's used in the, in the research literature. And I said, let's give it a try. Let's give people some burritos, right? And then, you know, put it to bed. And so they found these really cool effects. Um, and so what the new Netflix documentary did is they repeated it using, like, infrared... Uh, detection of genital arousal in women, which is just like the, I mean, you know, arousal in both men and women is due to blood flow. Yeah. And so one might presume that we get the same effect, and they did! How cool was that? Wow. Yeah. Wow. And yeah, yeah. So there was, there were identical twins randomized to either eat plant-based or, or, or continue their kind of meaty diets. And the women who switched plant-based had um, oh, and so they showed them porn. So they're like watching porn, eating their broccoli, and they, they, yeah, it was like a forest fire. What? Watching porn and eating broccoli. How's your Friday night? Man, that kind of makes me think, like, I got my start in broadcasting as a producer for a love song show, and every year we would have this big Valentine's ball, and we would have hundreds of couples come. It was at a nice hotel, and now I'm like, can you imagine what would have happened if we served a plant-based dinner that night? There you go. Holy God, yeah, man. Yeah. That hotel would have been a rockin', Jack. That's amazing. Uh, spring, right around the corner, uh, you kind of mentioned it, like giving your bodies a little bit of a, a, a clean up, right? What are some things that you would recommend for spring cleaning ourselves and getting going oh, yeah. on the same well, so that's process? autophagy. Yeah, so yeah. that's autophagy. So aerobic exercise, skipping the fries and chips, drinking coffee, and eating specific foods to reach a minimum of 20 milligrams of spermidine a day. That's how you boost spring cleaning within your cells. And you don't have to wait for spring. You can do it year-round. Remind us what the big spermidine foods are. The big spermidine foods, number one on the list is actually tempeh on a per-serving basis. However, on a gram-for-gram -gram basis, wheat germ is the most concentrated form. Um, uh, yeah, and cheapest as well. All right. so that's why I sprinkle wheat germ on my foods every day. I mix it half and half with my ground flax seeds, um, all thanks to the new book. It's got a nice flavor to it, right? What are, what are the, your other like dietary switches that you've made since you've made, uh, since you've released? Oh, all sorts of stuff. I learn just as much as anybody when I write the book than when people read the book. I mean, I wasn't taught any about anything like this in, in med school. In fact... There's entire fields of science, like these microRNAs, wasn't even discovered until after I graduated from medical school, challenging the central dogma of biology. Amazing stuff. How cool is that? Talk about a nutrition nerd. This was a book for, I mean, all sorts of cool stuff in it. Um, so, okay, so I started eating more tempeh. I um, started eating more mushrooms, porcini mushrooms, the highest source of ergothionine, which is another longevity vitamin. Um, uh, made in the kind of by fungi, so if you're not eating mushrooms, you're not getting it. Um, uh, strawberries, you know, normally I do something like blackberries, I have five times more antioxidants than strawberries. So it's like, you know, I like them both, might as well use blackberries. Nope! What it, little did I know that it didn't have the facetin, this um, uh, purported senolytic compound found almost exclusively in strawberries. You're not eating strawberries, you're not getting it. So now I carry around a little pack, this just this morning. Um, on my oatmeal, I, I whip out a packet of my little freeze-dried strawberry powder because I can get fresh strawberries on the road often. I'm doing it for my senolytic compound. So, um, oh, and uh, I'm doing uh, papali, which is this, you get it in a kind of Indian spice store. It's uh, also in Europe, it's known as long pepper. And it's the source of something called pipilongumine, which is another senolytic compound. Uh, I'm doing ground ginger now, I never did before. What else have I changed my diet? Uh, I think those are the big ones. That seems like a lot, to, and you do those every day? You get those Well, I try. I okay. mean, you know, if I'm not stuck in Mississippi somewhere. It's funny, I was at this, this airport in this deep south, and I could, it was a little airport, I couldn't find anything to eat, and that's super rare. 
right? I mean, like, you, I mean, they gotta have a salad. You gotta have something you can eat, right? But there was nothing I'd find in the entire airport. Couldn't find a banana, I an apple, no, nothing? No, no, no! Wow. Okay. So finally, I see this on the menu. I'm like, oh my God, they got a portobello burger. I'm like, oh, this is amazing. So I order it, and what is it? It's a burger with some sliced portobellos on top. No! <laughs> of course it was! What was I thinking? Ay. Is that the hardest part of the country, by and large, for you to Oh, to? yeah. I mean, I can get... Well, yeah, Europe was amazing. Yeah? Oh, my God. Denmark? Every single 7-Eleven had a whole whole food plant-based section. Not I mean, like, I was lentils. Lentils in a 7-Eleven. Ah, oh, I what? almost did not want to leave. For real? No, the government of Denmark is spending 200 million euros on plant-based initiatives in the country. They were paying the Vegetarian Society of Denmark to bring me in to speak. Yeah, like these, the, agri the Secretary of Agriculture was like front row at my talk. Like, yeah, and was a fan. It was ridiculous. What yeah, it was is happening cool. right now? Yeah, 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 yeah. No, they are like, they, yeah, yeah, it was, yeah, leaps and bounds. To the good listeners of Denmark, I would love to do an episode of the show. Come with. We'll go to 7-Eleven oh, and yeah, get no. some lentils. Oh, you will not be disappointed. I can't believe it. Has anybody gone into 7-Eleven and seen lentils? Oh, my God, good. Is Was it here in Canada or were you in Denmark, ma'am? Denmark. Denmark! Woo! Germany. Oh, Germany is kicking it. Okay. Totally kicking it. Man. Yeah, it's one of the few countries where meat consumption, per capita meat consumption is plummeting. Wow. Yeah, they, they're like major meat companies. They're completely switching over to plant-based. What do you think right. it's going to take for meat consumption in the States and in North America to just fall off a cliff now, too? I don't know. We'll see what the Germans are doing. Uh, well, I think default, uh, default uh, plant-based options. I mean, that's the most exciting things, I think, yeah. happening. Uh, you know, so like New York City, all public health hospitals, all 11 hospitals, by, de by default, every lunch, every supper, strictly plant-based. Um, and uh, if people refuse the, the default plant-based, they're offered another plant-based option. Nice. Yeah. The default is another plant-based default. Only after they refuse two default plant-based they do they then get to see, like, the meat menu. Nice. Right. They do it upright in New York, man. I um, mean, healthy food in a hospital? What a concept. I remember when I was sick in the hospital one time, it was, like, looking at the menu, and, like, this was old Chuck, and, and just, like, being amazed at how tasty it looked. Like, cheeseburgers, fried chicken, macaroni and cheese ham and cheese, tuna fish. It didn't even dawn on me that none of that was healthy food. I guess there was even a part of me that thought, like, I'm in a hospital, so how bad could this possibly be for me? Repeat business. Is that what it boils down to? No, it boils down to giving people what they want. Right. And what do people want? Well, they've been bombarded their whole lives by messages to eat fast food and junk food because that's the most profitable food. You don't make money selling stuff that's perishable. You don't make money selling fruits and vegetables. They rot in the shelves. You pay, make money selling little snack cakes that last for weeks on the shelves or, you know, bottles of, of sh brown sugar water. It's like all profit. That's how you make yeah. money. It's not like the head of Coca-Cola is sitting around trying to, how can I contribute to the childhood obesity epidemic? No, they're saying, how do I satisfy the earnings from my shareholders for the next quarter? And if they think of anything else, they get a conscience for one second, they'll get booted out and replaced by someone who won't think about that for one second and will satisfy the earnings of the shareholders for the next quarter. And, you know, life goes on. Big business. These big food companies do not necessarily have our family's best interests in mind. That's why we need to take some control over our diet. Why don't you sit on the board for Yum Brands or Sodexo or something like that? Oh, is that like a dig at like Dean Ornish? He was like on the board of, he do like McDonald's and you know, all that stuff. Sorry, Dean, I, I didn't know that. Yeah, well, I mean, uh, you can imagine. The man under the no, no, so he got a lot of flack for that. So McDonald's wanted him to be on like the, some board of whatever, healthy eating or whatever. And he agreed to do it. Um, and he got a lot of flack for that. But you could totally see him being like, well, who do you want on advising McDonald's, right? 
But it did seem like, in retrospect, I think a bit of greenwashing, right? They were just like, look, we've got Dean Ornish. We can't right. be that bad. Right. But did they actually do anything to actually make things healthier? Yeah. But, you know, the fact that he did it, if they asked me to do it, I'd consider it. I mean, if, if, if I thought I could actually have an impact. I think you have to, right? Because Exactly. Because you don't know until you try. If you say no, there's no way you can affect any sort of change. Well, whatsoever. yeah, but would I be continuing to put out, like, McDonald's' evil incarnate videos if I was on their board? I mean, maybe they, they, they just want to kind of blunt me a little bit. I'd probably request you, well, we're going to bring you on the board, but you got to take all these See, down See, I wouldn't want to do that. Right. Right, right. What would it take? I mean, just like no holds barred, Dr. Greger is going to be Dr. Greger, but I will advise you to the best of my ability kind of deal? Um, well, so I wouldn't take money. Um, and, I, and yeah, I mean, I'd only, right. And I wouldn't let them like use my face, likeness, anything. But if like they were genuinely interested in what's healthy, they don't need to go to me. They could, you know, ask any, you know, good nutrition scientist. Sure. But, you know, I'd be happy to... Sure. Tell them to change their business model. Well, here's what interests me, though, is you're talking about the health advancements in, in food in, in Europe. I mean, just 7-Eleven and lentils. But the fast food restaurants over there, Burger King, McDonald's, all of them, KFC, gravitating toward more and more plant-based options. And not only that, that here. not only that, but they're making plant-based options cheaper. So, like, here you walk into, like, a Burger King, and they have, like, an Impossible Whopper, but it's actually more expensive than, like, the regular Whopper because it's, like, a specialty item or something. Right. Whereas in Europe, they intentionally, whether or not they're cheaper or not, actually make it on parity or cheaper than the meat option um, in, in a way of trying to push people in that direction. All right, let's do some rapid fire before we open it up to the gallery here, um, which will help unlock longevity faster almond milk or soy milk simple question talk about a softball question love it your way doc what do we say thank you soy milk soy milk tepe or tofu not even close come on come on come on what kind of question is that tepe or tofu same thing. Tempeh, right? It's a whole soy food. You can see the individual little soybeans in there, whereas tofu is a processed food. Now, of course, soybeans are so healthy, you can process and still have really healthy food like tempeh, tofu, but why not get a whole soy food like edamame or whole soybeans out of can, et cetera, et cetera. Coffee or tea? Ooh, them is fighting words. They are. How many coffee drinkers do we have? Show of hands. How many tea drinkers? Oh, man, we got an even split here, Doc. Both. Both. Okay. Yeah. So uh, three cups of coffee a day associated with 13% lower risk of premature death. Three cups of tea every day, 24% decreased risk of premature death, but through an entirely different mechanism. So we would presume that is an additive effect. And so I would encourage you to drink both tea and coffee, which is what I do. Yoga or running? Oh, running. Swimming or walking? Walking. Weight training or not at all? <laughs> not at all? Weight training, of course. Weight, weight training. Uh, okay, uh, skipping breakfast or eating breakfast? Eating a big breakfast. Big breakfast. Uh, green grapes, purple grapes? Purple grapes. Come on, man. Come on. Red. Seeded purple grape with the seeds in it. Oh, Talk to us about the seeds. Why are the seeds important? Well, the seeds have more nutrition than the rest of it combined. Mm. Yeah, number one is the seeds, number two is the skins, and then the flesh really doesn't have much. But somebody said to me once, they were like, Chuck, I heard you talk about grape seeds on the podcast, but they've got cyanide. Like, do you really want to die? You're going to hey, die if you, you eat that about? grape, man. I think you're thinking about apple seeds or peach pits or something. All right, man. That, they weren't my words, Dr. Gregor. These uh -huh. were not my words. Uh -huh. I'm just relaying uh, yeah, the message. A friend told you. Yeah. A friend. <laughs> Probably read that on Bob's blog. Uh, red wine or chocolate? Where do you right. fall on wine, by the way? Like, Where do I fall on it? Yeah, like alcohol in general. Some people yeah. say it's got some benefits. A lot of new studies say there's no health benefit to it whatsoever. Is there an upside to alcohol? According to the World Heart Federation, the World Health Organization, the Global Burning Disease Study, the largest study of risk factors for health and disease in history, the only safe intake of, of alcohol is none. Oh. Sorry to be Dr. Buzzkill. Literally, in this case, Indeed. Dr. Buzzkill. Yeah. Uh, all right. 
And uh, so yeah, so uh, dark chocolate would be better. But even better would be cocoa powder, which is the chocolate with the sugar and fat removed. So okay, so w I guess that that's that's the other thing, right? Because by and large, would you say that when people say chocolate, they think about milk chocolate, the Hershey bars, the candy bars, the things like that. And people, when they say, "Well, chocolate is healthy," we see that splashed across the headlines. People gravitate for the Hershey's Kisses. They gravitate for the Snickers. But in reality, it is that raw cocoa or cacao where the benefits lie. Yeah, that's the benefits. Yeah, yeah. So you just impair it. You're just you know. Washing out the benefits when you're having it with sugar, having it with, uh, you know, milk, all that stuff. You a yeah, so uh, a tablespoon of natural cocoa powder a day is actually a recommendation for the new book. That's something else I'm doing. New. Oh, cardamom, another thing. I'm adding cardamom to my cocoa. That's another thing. Uh, oh, cardam cardamom is a stack, is a sirtuin activating food. You know I can't let that just hang out there. Oh, I'm working on a new book. What? No, you just dropped something on us. So we've got How Not to Die, How Not to Age. What's the next one? Oh, good question. Well, if you would have asked me a couple of weeks ago, I would have told you my next book's on cancer. Ah. On, uh, on, uh, uh, on cancer survival. But, uh, but the publisher didn't like it. What? Sent in a proposal. And uh, the publisher is like, ah, it's too like too much of a little niche, right? We want to have a more broadly, it, it broad, broader interest. I'm like, oh yeah, cancer, the disease no one's ever heard of, that only affects a very small, but ridiculous. But yeah, they wanted more kind of a general kind of wellness thing. Um, so but I sent in another proposal. Um, we'll see what stay happens. Stay tuned. I'd rather, I'd really, I won't really want to do the cancer, but we may switch publishers. Hey Siri, how many cases of cancer are diagnosed every year? Here's what I found. Oh, well, she didn't tell me, but uh, 1.6 million in, uh, in the U.S. alone in 2020. So I would think that a person or two would have heard no, of that. No, well, we have tens of millions of cancer survivors. So it's all about cancer survival, what you can do to extend your... Um, uh, your health and lifespan uh, battling cancer. And so, uh, and there's all sorts of really juicy studies out there where you can yeah. randomize people to flax seeds or not flax seeds and actually see significantly improved cancer survival. Um, but uh, each cancer is different, so it'll be a huge research project. I'm thinking of covering all cancers that kill 5,000 Americans or more every year. I think it comes out to about 16 different types of cancer. And they each have different foods that seem to help um, or hurt. So I, I would come up with like a daily protocol, like this is what, if you have this cancer, this is what you should eat every day kind of thing. And this is the same publisher that was giving you grief about the other stuff? Uh, yeah, so yeah, I don't know. We'll, we'll see okay. what happens. No, there's other books. So I want to do a mental health book. There's a, I want to do How Not to Hurt, talking about chronic pain management with uh, lifestyle interventions. I mean, there's a lot of good stuff I can cover, but the cancer one people there's just, again that's an area that's so much misinformation so much i was just talking to a cancer survivor today who was told don't exercise and eat extra ice cream that's about what we're getting from the oncology community these days so i feel like a book is in order question uh make some noise here just so we can kind of send this over to the publisher how many people here round of applause would read dr greger's book on cancer The tribe has spoken. I think so. All right. All Who, right. Who's got a question for Dr. Greger? Uh, Stephen, Stephen's going to come around with the mic. Hi, my name, my name is Colin. I'm from Toronto. I just wonder what nutritional effect freezing food has. What can you say about freezing food? Uh, the, um, uh, it is a very um, nutrient-preserving way of, uh, of sustaining nutrition food. So sometimes frozen fruits and vegetables can actually be more nutritious than fresh because so-called fresh has been on a ship from New Zealand for the last couple of weeks, losing nutrition every day, whereas frozen can be frozen the day that it was picked, um, actually retain more nutrition. So if you look at my freezer, it's half frozen greens, half frozen berries, um, and super convenient way, right? It's already pre-washed, pre-chopped, um, you know, it's not a lot of waste involved, and you can buy it, you know, at times of the year where fresh produce can be expensive, um, and, you know, you just stock up, and yeah, I love it. I don't know, yeah, when my electricity goes out and everything in my freezer turns to mush, I get very sad. 
Hi, my name is Elisa. I met you earlier. I am originally from Buenos Aires, Argentina, but I've lived in Toronto my whole life. Um, I have a two-part question for you. So um, if someone uh, had cancer in their 20s, can they still live a long life? So um, what, what, it, it depends on what treatments you got for that cancer. So uh, let's say that uh, they had chemotherapy, surgery, radiation, and then they went to a naturopath and they eat a whole foods plant-based diet and they try to exercise and go into nature and follow you adamantly. Um, Those are all good things. Um, yeah, so the, there, the, there are long-term effects of cancer treatments. Uh, the short-term effect of cancer treatments can be saving your life, so that's a good thing, but Unfortunately, you can suffer at the, at the far end um, from, and depending on what parts of your body were irradiated, stuff, pulmonary fibrosis and heart problems. And so it's, the bottom line is just particularly important for someone who has undergone conventional cancer treatments to eat exquisitely healthy and have an exquisitely healthy lifespan and certainly not smoke and certainly not drink and certainly not, you know, and so it's just like everybody else has to eat healthy. No, you really have to eat healthy. And it's just because you already have you know, something on one side of the scale. You know, it's like someone who has a, a bad genetic predisposition to have really high cholesterol levels. Well, the answer is not throw up your hands and be like, ah, I guess there's nothing I can do. No, you really got to work on it. Oh, my God. I mean, you've got to go all in. And so same thing. It's just a matter of you know, being extra careful to... Um, to live as healthfully as you possibly can. So my, I guess you've sort of answered the second part of my question. What is the number one thing that someone who survived cancer should do to be able to live a really long life? And by the way, my great auntie, she lived to be 105, and she was a, well, back in those days, veganism didn't exist, but she was a vegetarian for the majority of her life. And so she's my role model. Oh, that's fantastic. So I hope to, I hope to live in her footsteps to fight. Excellent. Despite no, having I love it. I love it. And in terms of specifically what you can do to maximize um, your health and longevity um, after a cancer diagnosis, I will know when I do the research. I think that what you said there is we're waiting for the next question is like, instead of just throwing up your hands and saying, yeah, Forget it. Like, it's so important that you dig in. It's even more important. Right. right. I mean, right. right. So it's the, it's the people with the genetic, the bad genes. Oh, my God. That's right. not an excuse. That's like a double down. Right. So it's not like you, you can unring the bell completely, but you can certainly blunt the ring of the bell. And I think that, that that's a huge takeaway message. So never, ever, ever just give up. Like, go for it as hard as you possibly can. That's yeah, and uh, tomorrow I'll talk about how diet can absolutely trump genetics. Um, talking about, for example, the Nigerian paradox, where they have among the highest rates of the Alzheimer's gene in the world, yet they have some of the lowest rates of Alzheimer's disease, and that's explained by their low cholesterol levels because of a diet low in animal fat, and I talk about why that all makes sense. So uh, make sure you come early, get a good seat. Huge. Hi, my name is Andy, and I'm really glad you're here today, and I'm glad I'm here to see you. Um, on the tail end of your wonderful question, when you do receive radiation treatment here in Ontario, you have to sign a consent form that you will not sue the hospital in 20 to 25 years when your cancer comes back due to the radiation. And they list the type of cancers that you might have, leukemia being number one. So for me, that's something I do worry about. And are there any measures that you recommend particularly for people who have been exposed to radiation? I don't know if that's a different question. Yeah, yeah. So, so it's, not, it's not that the cancer is coming back, but that the radiation will cause entirely new cancers that you never would have had had you not been exposed to radiation. Again, if the radiation is going to, I mean, you're not going to get a chance to die from cancer in 20 years if you die from cancer now. And so one could argue in certain circumstances to, to, to get the prescribed conventional treatments. But um, what can you do to decrease one's risk? Well, um, the, the goal, and again, I will know a lot more once I do the deep dive, um, but the, 
uh, the, the progression of most so-called epithelial tumors, or mo the common cancers, like prostate and breast and colon and lung, the top cancer killers, are, take decades to grow, right? They're very slow growing. And so the goal is to die with your cancer, not from your cancer. And so we can slow down the doubling rate of cancer, the rate at which a, a tumor doubles, um, by with with uh, with lifestyle change. So even though the initiation stage of cancer, which is that first genetic mutation, the uncorrected DNA mutation that causes that turns the cell cancerous, even though that might not be able to be prevented, and you know that could be something you experience in the womb or something. But then, one cancer cell never hurt anybody. Two cancer cells never hurt anybody. Four cancer cells, now a billion cancer cells, then we're running into problem. In fact, a billion is about a centimeter, about what you, you know, start picking up a mammogram or something. Um, and so it's like, okay, we gotta get up to a billion. If we can slow down the rate at which the tumor doubles to get to that billion before it can break off and start spreading throughout your body, well, um, that would be that would be the goal, and so there's a number of things that can slow down the rate of cancer growth. I have a few videos, um, some things I've kind of stumbled on along the way, but the book will be a chance of doing kind of a systematic review of every single natural intervention that's ever been proven in randomized controlled trials to actually extend cancer survival. We'll find out. She's asking about aromatase inhibitors. So aromatase inhibitors are are. Uh, a class of drugs involved in certain hormonal cancers like breast cancer. It's, a, it, it's your body's way of creating kind of estrogen from scratch, particularly for women postmenopausal. They no longer have ovaries churning out estrogen, but your own body using this enzyme called aromatase can make estrogen, and that can fuel some hormone-sensitive tumors. And so the thought is, well, if we use, if we inhibit that enzyme, keep the estrogen levels really low, then we would prevent kind of recurrence of estrogen receptor positive or receptive cancers. Um, and so, and the, one of the benefits is they tend to be relatively, as chemotherapy agents go, similar like tamoxifen, have a very good kind of side effect profile um, comparatively. Um, there are foods that have aromatase inhibition activities like this, um, uh, the uh, seeds of grapes, um, and which is um, probably why women drinking red wine don't get as much breast cancer as those drinking white wine. Um, and also um, uh, white button mushrooms. White mushrooms actually have a, or, or have a aromatase inhibitor as well. But if you were prescribed a, an aromatase inhibitor, just eating mushrooms uh, is insufficient. Right, we got time for two more questions here, two more. Uh, my name is Ranish, I'm from Toronto. Uh, nice to meet you, Dr. Greger. Uh, great to hear you talk. Um, my question is relating to it. This is something that Peter Atia uh, brings up, and he says, in relation to health span, um, one of the great reducers of health span is sarcopenia or age-related muscle loss. So he's of the position that people should be weightlifting, consuming large amounts of protein, 1.6 uh, grams per kilogram body weight, because once you reach, reach age 70, it's very hard to build muscle, and any sort of uh, IDF1 sort of cancer growth-related effects of eating high protein and muscle building is offset by the health span gains of having increased muscle mass into old age. And I just want to get your thoughts on that balance between increasing muscle and the risks of a high protein diet and that health span, lifespan sort of trade off and balance. Thank you. You can have the best of both worlds by doing resistance exercise, strength training, that it's use it or lose it. That's the best thing to do to counter age-related muscle loss is resistance training. Um, and restricting protein down to recommended levels, which is 0.8 grams per healthy kilogram of body weight. Um, otherwise, and so adding extra protein, going beyond 0.8, adding extra protein to the diets of older women does not increase muscle mass, increase muscle strength, or increase muscle performance. It just doesn't work. Um, and so all you get is the increase in the pro-aging hormone IGF-1, the pro-aging enzyme mTOR, decrease in the pro-longevity hormone FGF-21, 
uh, you know, metabolic issues, de- drop in testosterone, all the things you get from adding extra protein to your diet. So, um, so restricting protein down to 0.8 grams, or after age 65, maybe restricting down to one uh, gram per healthy kilogram body weight. Um, uh, and so then you get all those benefits, and then you maintain your muscle mass by working out. And the final question. Hi, Dr. Greger. My name is Mimi Thrasher, and I'm from Burlington, Ontario. What I would like to know is your thoughts or opinions about live cell microscopy. Oh, fancy. Um, so, uh, any time, so yeah, that's funny, that's funny. Um, so, uh, yeah, so uh, the, the question was about live cell microscopy. So, uh, basically, total scam, but if a total scam gets you to eat healthier, you know, so it's like these people saying, uh, making up all sorts of crazy, wacky BS pseudoscience about alkaline diets. And they say, okay, so because of all this wacky pseudoscience, you should eat dark green leafy vegetables and you cut down on meat. It's like, well, you know, if your crazy religion or crazy whatever gets you to do good things, eh, you're not so hard on it, you know. Um, but, you know, it would be also be nice. Like, so, like, if, you know, you see, if you're eating healthy because voices in your head from little green men in Mar- from Mars told you to eat healthy, I'm like, okay, you know, go little green men. But so there's lots of things. But unfortunately, you know, uh, things like, tools like that could be used to sell all sorts of supplements or whatever. Um, and so, you know, so there's like a lot of, you know, I think of, there are like legitimate tests, like coronary calcium scanning, you know, where they actually put you in a CT scanner and, and expose you to relatively low dose uh, X radiation and to, to pick up these kind of calcified plaques in your arteries. And that is actually not recommended by the USPSTF, which is uh, kind of the preventive services, you know, task force, the kind of official body that uh, determines what is and is not uh, good preventive medicine. And the reason is because, you know, we don't want to be exposing people to radiation unnecessarily, but if, like, you are not going to improve your diet, until you are shown a picture of your heart with all these little white spots in it, saying, see all that? That is going to, you know, you, have, you are ravaged by heart disease and are going to drop dead. If that picture is going to get you to clean up your diet, that test was totally worth it, right? Now, it would be nice to be, I mean, we should be able to tell people that based on non-invasive, non-radioactive things, to be like, you have all sorts of, you are being ravaged by heart disease, and you're going to die from it. And they're like, okay, but they're not going to change their diet. But if I expose you to radiation and show you a picture, okay. So you could argue that that was actually a really good test. Was it a good test? Was it necessary? Probably not. But if it gets you to eat healthier, I'm down for it. So if you got some wacky, you know, urine test that, you know, some, you know, you're, you're communicating with the dead and that says if you like, you know, you know, I don't know, worship this crystal, you know, then you, you know, you worship this crystal and eat a whole food plant-based diet, you will live a long time. And you're like, okay. And you wouldn't have done it just without the crystal Crystal away, baby. Uh, so let's let's end with this then. Let's end with, uh, I guess, a little bit of hope. Let's say that you do go for that. You get the image that shows that your heart uh, is really in need of some attention. Your urine test shows that you're being haunted by seven ghosts, and and you really need to make some changes. How far gone does a person really need to be before you know they are no longer able to reverse the aging process or slow it down? How far uh, gone is too never far? Never too late. It is never too late to start eating healthier, to stop smoking, to start moving. We really do have the power, and that's the good news. So we have tremendous power over our health, destiny, and longevity, that the vast majority of premature death and disability is preventable with a healthy enough plant-based diet and lifestyle. There it is. Dr. Michael Greger, the author of How Not to Age. Thank you so much for the time. It's always a joy when you're on the show, my friend. That was fun. All right. Thank you to everybody here in Toronto. Thank you to Stephen.
and the crew here at the Planted Expo. You guys are phenomenal. Thank you so very much. Be sure to listen on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, wherever it is that you get your shows. And by goodness gracious, give Dr. Gregor and Nutrition Facts a follow on social media as well. And get the copy of the book, How Not to Age. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you.